All right, welcome folks. So today I'm going to be discussing Doug Brignol, what I think of him and his training ideas. So firstly, thanks for making it onto my channel. If you have any questions or comments, pop them down below. And if you'd like to work with me on your own strength and physique goals, there is a link in the description. So let's get on with this. Now, I was asked to talk about Doug Brignol by about three uh, people in my comments, um, three or four people in my comments. And uh, they were all quite curious about what I thought of him or him compared to, say, my repertoire, whatever. So first, let's just dive into him and who he is. I think, um, yeah, I mean, the guy is the real deal. You know, I mean, look at him. He's an absolute Chad, right? This was him when he was younger. I don't think many of us look like that when we were that age. So firstly, the guy is the real deal. He is an absolute Chad. He won the Mr. America when I was about one year of age. Okay, so he's been doing it for a long time. Also, if we compare him to other prominent members of the, I don't know, fringe fitness group, I guess you could say, guy like Dave Asprey, who was recently on my radar. And, uh, you know, compared to Dave, I mean, Doug looks like an absolute beast. Doug is uh, more than 20 years my senior. Dave is actually just a handful of years older than I am. So <laughs> I know who I'd want to take advice from if I was a young guy looking for, you know, anti-aging advice, and it'd probably be Doug rather than somebody like Dave Asprey. So first of all, just to emphasize, Doug is the real deal. Okay, so whatever I'm about to say on his training philosophy um, is, you know, it takes nothing away from the guy. The guy is a stud. So um, just to give you guys a brief look on what his new sort of thing is that he's marketing. So he talks about something called the Brig 20. And this idea that he's discussing things based on biomechanics. So he emphasizes that there are roughly 20 or so exercises per muscle group, which are biomechanically efficient. And that is the criteria for which we should judge their effectiveness. This idea that you need to place more stress on the muscle, take into account its function and its joint angles, stuff like that. So having a load through the full range of motion and the way that the muscle moves is ideal. Okay, so one of the examples he gave on the uh, Mark Bell podcast was of sissy squats being very effective because with the sissy squat, you move the quad through the full range of motion from contraction to uh, full stretch. So that's his idea. And that's why sissy squat is emphasized over a squat. So that's basically what his belief system is. Now, the particular example of the squat to the sissy squat, he says that when you're loading up a squat, you're only getting to about, say, 30 to 50% of the range of motion, depending on how deep you squat, as you would do if you were doing a sissy squat. So when you drop down into the hole of a squat, your uh, knee only comes forward a little bit. And as a result, your quad is only flexed by maybe 50% of what it is capable of flexing. Therefore, the sissy squat is capable of producing more stress on the muscle through a greater range of motion. Therefore, it's a better exercise. That's his argument. Just to put it into perspective, I'm just telling you what his argument is. That is not what necessarily what I believe in or not. But that's his argument to say why the sissy squat is a superior movement to the squat for the purposes of hypertrophy and building muscle. So the problem with that is <laughs> it's actually a very easy argument to tear down. Um, so let's go on. Now, it's a very easy argument to dismantle. The first point is that the joints and the muscles are capable of handling more load nearer full contraction and less load near a full extension or stretch. So let's give you guys an example of that. You are capable of handling more load at the lockout of a bench press than you are in the bottom position. Okay, that is just basic biomechanics, right? Um, just like with a squat, you're capable of handling more load standing up in a squat than you are in the deep squat position. This is just basic common knowledge, right? Therefore, if you only limit yourself to the weight which you are used, which is usable at full stretch, you'll never actually tax the muscles throughout the rest of the range of motion. Do you see what I'm saying, it's a very easy argument to dismantle to say we should only be doing exercises which allow us to get into a full stretch because then the weight we use on those exercises will only limit us, will, will be limited to the weight we can use at a full stretch. We will never tax the muscle through its full range of motion because it's not just about taxing a muscle at full stretch. It's also about taxing a muscle for the rest of the range of motion as well. 
So give you some examples of that. It's like uh, with um, bent over rows. Uh, some people pause at the chest or at the stomach with bent over rows. The problem with that is the bent over row is a particularly difficult movement at the top. So if you are limiting yourself to what you can use by pausing at the top, well, then the rest of the range, it might feel hard at the top, but the rest of the range of motion is woefully underdeveloped, is understimulated. Now, a good example of how this is um, uh, how this is worked around in a sporting example is accommodating resistance. So using bands and using chains. That's an amazing way that Westside Barbell have allowed their lifters to tax their muscle through a full range of motion. So in a barbell squat, when they do their squats on a speed day, what they'll do is they'll have loads of band tension. So at the bottom, the bands are deloaded. So it's hard at the bottom. And as they stand up, the weight gets easier, but the bands drag them down. So you get an even amount of weight from the bottom position where it's harder to the top position where it should be easier, but you get more load. So in, rather than have a, have a force curve, which is easier at the bottom and harder at the top, it ends up just being hard all the way throughout. So <laughs> that's one solution, which is actually used in sports, the sports of powerlifting, um, American football, and God knows what else, to get over this problem. Doug hasn't thought of that. So you see what I mean? It's very easy to dismantle this argument that you should only really tax the muscles um, for a full range of motion because you're, you're missing out on so much. You're missing out on all that um, growth potential because your muscles are relatively understimulated along the other range of motion. So yes, for that end 20% of the range of motion, it's maximally taxed. But what about the rest of the 80%? You're getting nothing from it. So one way of around that is accommodating resistance. Another way around that is, well, how do people regularly train? How do, you know, well, let's go on to the next point. So the next point is, it's a logical fallacy. So if we take statement one, the muscle can be loaded up through a fuller range of motion. That's his idea. Statement two, loading muscle through a fuller range of motion is only relevant variable for growth. But that's not true. The conclusion, it discounts the importance of absolute load and the greater strength at different joint angles. So he's making a logical fallacy by saying that you have to load up the muscle through a full range of motion. Uh, what he's effectively saying is that loading a muscle up through a full range of motion is the only relevant variable, but it's not though, because it discounts that you can load the muscle with more weight when it's further away from full stretch, when it's closer to full contraction. So it's a logical fallacy. That's what he's saying. He's, his, his entire argument is based on this idea that you have to load a muscle through a full range of motion. The thing is you're limiting the weight used in the other ranges of motion, which limited, limits the stress you put on the muscle ultimately. And that's one of the reasons why the sissy squat just isn't as effective as a squat for actually building quads. Um, and yeah, number three, the easy to dismantle argument part three. What have the biggest people traditionally done? So as I started saying previously, the biggest people, they've traditionally used a combination of heavy weight for compound exercises. And compound exercises allow you to use heavy weight because you're never in a full stretch position. Okay, you go from like a moderate stretch to a full contraction with a squat, with a bench, with deadlifts, all that kind of stuff. And then they combine that with lighter exercises for isolation exercises, which you are typically at a full stretch. That's how the biggest and strongest people have always trained because they, from practical experience, they know that it's not just about the lighter isolation exercises. It's not just about loading a muscle through those extreme stretch positions you have to actually load it through the rest of the range of motion as well. And if you only do light isolation exercises, your muscles are gonna remain relatively untaxed during the rest of the range of motion. So it's a very easy argument to dismantle. The biomechanics angle doesn't really hold up. So my last thing is, I wanna just, uh, yeah, I wanna just say here, firstly, uh, beware of the buzzword. Okay, so I, a, a few years ago, I was sat having dinner with some non-lifter friends um, and there were this one who owns a business, the other lady who's a uh, doctor, she's a PhD in agriculture or something like that. Not a medical doctor, but a, a PhD in agriculture. They're just regular people, some of my you know regular friends from university. And uh, I was sat around and we were talking lifting and um, this PhD lady, she says, I like functional training. <laughs> and I was like, this is crazy. Like she doesn't really know a squat from a deadlift, but she knows functional. Right, so this was about 10 years ago. 
And um, even the layman back then knew the word functional because it was such a buzzword. Everybody was writing articles, espousing functional as this like amazing thing and using it to say that anything which is non-functional was just rubbish, right? And so general people like her, just regular folk like her, they didn't know much about training. They didn't know squats. They didn't know deadlifts. They didn't know how to do those correctly. They didn't know anything about periodization or working hard in the gym or sets and reps, but they knew the word functional. And so people were selling their programs, selling their expertise by just saying this word functional is the be all and end all. And I have a feeling that Doug is using the word biomechanics in the same way. It's a very, it's a, it, it has a precise meaning, but the way that he uses it is very vague. And it's seemingly used as just a catch all for, to justify his methods. So just be wary of the buzzword because I care about you guys and I don't want you to end up like this when, <laughs> when you pay attention to nothing but buzzwords. Ouch. Yeah, we don't want that, do we? No, we don't. Absolutely horrific. So um, hopefully that's cleared up my opinion on Doug. In summary, first of all, the guy's an absolute stud. He's the real deal. Secondly, I don't agree with his Brig 20 because I think it discounts the uh, the fact that optimal growth is uh, done by loading up the muscle with heavier weight in the range of motion where it can use heavier weight. And if you're only using exercises which tax you through a full range of motion, you will be limited by the weakest range of motion. It's very simple to dismantle. It's not a particularly difficult um, concept to understand, and it's not a particularly difficult um, uh, training approach to dismantle. So there you go. That's my thoughts. Bottom line, I still like Doug. I think he's a cool guy. And he looks like, I wish I looked like I was 60 myself. So take care.